Um, so thank you um, for, for joining today. My name is Kimberly Davis, and I am a a data dissemination specialist with the Census Bureau. And so my job is to help people access data that the Census Bureau provides. Um, so we're going to go through today. Um, okay, okay. So my job is to help people access data that's available at the Census Bureau. And so the program that I'm part of is the Data Dissemination and Training Branch. And um, we also operate the Census Academy, which has um, a hub for learning tools and videos. Um, there's three ways that opportunity to learn. One is um, there's how-to videos on the data gems. We also have courses and then we have webinars that are both recorded and the opportunity for participants to uh, interact live with those, those um, events. Um, so today our objective will be to understand the, the data sources and topics that are available. Um, we're going to go over a little bit of geography and the comprehension of the different geographic levels. Uh, we will review table types so that um, you all can understand maybe some of what's available and what you're looking at when you're navigating um, on data.census.gov. And then we'll, we'll use three case examples. Hopefully I'll have enough time now to go through those case examples to help you do a little bit of navigating on data.census.gov because it's not always really intuitive. So, so our agenda will start with topics that are available on the census uh, website, and then we'll go into the geography matters, um, the table type understanding, and, and then navigating on data.census.gov. Okay, so um, who we are and, and what do we do for those that are not aware, uh, the Census Bureau's mission is to serve as the leading provider of quality data about its people and economy. Um, we operate under Title 13 and 26, which means that um, we, we collect data, but we can't compromise anyone's identity when we produce the statistics about the data that we've collected. So every everything is kept um, in, in privacy um, and and we don't want to disclose any any confidential information. So everyone becomes a number to us no matter how we collect the data. Um, we we do a couple of things when we uh, collect data. We we work with other federal agencies and we often collect data for them uh, because we have the resources in place for data collection. So in doing that, we collect from a number of uh, surveys and programs for other federal agencies like we do the American Housing Survey for HUD, we do the current population survey for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and, and when we collect for so many resources, often we're asking the same questions. So we use linkage and administrative data in lieu of replicating questions, burdening respondents, and, um, and continuing waste. Um, the other thing that we do at the Census Bureau is collect international data. We do um, a few things. We are mapping the globe for the UN, and we also produce statistics for other countries on import, exports, and populations. Um, some of the key programs that we operate are are the economic census and the census of governments. These two programs are done every five years. They're mandatory. And um, the way that we operate them is consecutively because they enter Yes, thank you, Kalei. Okay, so um, we are on slide. Um, four for for the I'm sorry five for for who we are and what we do um, at the Census Bureau. Perfect. And okay, so now let's move on to slide six. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with the American Community Survey, um, it's it's also known as ACS, 
and it replaced the census long form after 2000 because uh, we decided we need data more current than every 10 years. And so Congress implemented the ACS, which is a mandatory survey. It surveys about three and a half million households every year. We sample in every county, and it is a random sampling that's done. Um, so it, it does help to inform on uh, trillions of dollars in federal funding every year. Um, it covers 40 topics, and it does go up to Congress to reassess the questions that we're asking and see if we need to make changes to the ACS. So we're in review now about the ACS, and we're taking uh, feedback on, on some of the proposed changes. But everything we ask on all the program uh, surveys and censuses it has to be tied to federal funding. We can only ask questions that are tied to federal funding. We can't ask anything else. So that also drives a lot of the, the topics that we do. Um, when we release the ACS, it's released in three formats. We do it every year. And we collect for one year and, and tabulate the data and, and uh, produce it usually in September in the fall for the first one year that we collected. That is for any geography populated of 65,000 or more. If the population falls less than that, we do a supplement estimate for the one previous year of data collection for geographies that have 20,000 or more. There aren't as many tables or cross-tabulations, uh, cross but, but it is available for those one-year supplements. But the most widely used ACS is the five-year data, and that is produced every year, but we aggregate data for the previous five years and produce the data every year, and those, those come out in December. But it's the most widely used because it covers so many geographies. You can get to a very low level of geography for this data. Um, it is more reliable because the sample size is larger, but it isn't as frequent of data as, as the one year and the supplemental one year, obviously. So ACS is the, the big data that, that most people use to, to access information about their community. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit, you're probably familiar with the census website, but we have at the top of it um, five primary tabs. And, and the first tab is the topics tab. Um, and I, we're going to talk a little bit about the topics because I think it's overlooked often. Um, the next one is the data and maps tab, which is where you can find the data products that house the data that we have available. The surveys and programs tab, which is the third one, is the source of all of the data that we collect. So you, if you go in there, it will give you information based on different programs and surveys that we collect data for, and it will link you to the sponsoring agency if it's not the Census Bureau. Uh, the, the last two are the resource library and the global search. The, the resource library is kind of a fun uh, collection of visualizations and infographics and, and fun publications and fact sheets. And the global search is, is that smart search that allows the user to type something in. It, we are evolving our global search. We had feedback from the public and most people said, I just want to type something in and, and have it returns like a Google search. And, and we try to do that, but the dynamics of so many uh, data points that we collect, it's, it's not as easy uh, because we, we need to narrow it down to what we do provide. But it will send you to information if we don't provide it on who does often on the topics that are available from, from the federal government. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the topics tab. If you hover over the Topics tab on the Census website, it gives you a drop-down menu. And in that drop-down menu, there's three ways you can use the topics. The, the first one is you can view all the topics and subtopics. And, and doing this, it gives you um, the option to, to navigate and narrow your search. 
The second one sends you to an index, which is our glossary of all the topics listed alphabetically. And it will connect you to not only the page, the topic page for that subject, but also provide the definition for, for that topic, which is important because the definitions aren't always what we think they are. And, and the third option is to select from the most widely searched topics uh, that are listed on the right. And, and this list changes depending on how people search for data at the Census Bureau, but these are the most widely used topics at this time. Okay, and the next slide. So if you select the first option, what the the tool allows you to do is to select a topic, but it allows you to narrow that search. So if you select the topic of people, it would allow you to select some subtopics like race, age, um, ethnicity, uh, foreign born, education. Uh, there's the, the full list encompassed within each of the topics. And then on the right, you can see that index list um, and how extens extensive it is. Um, I think one of the important things about the index page is when users are confused about why there are so many sources of data, this is a good place to look. Uh, because we have things like, um, if, if you click on the next slide, the, the topic of employment. And so if you go to the index and it sends you to the page of employment, if that's the subject you look at, it gives you details on the left menu about the topic. It will give you information from our, our highlighted America Count stories. But, but the third item, the data, it will tell you what sources we collect data on employment. And they can change depending on the financial um, implications of the, the federal reason we're collecting that data. And I'll give you an example. For the American Community Survey, we collect data about employment if the population is 16 years and older. And that it does include teenagers that work part-time, maybe at the movie theater during the summer season. Um, however, employment also defines how the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, collected on the current population survey, which is for those that are 14 years and older. Um, and then they go into details about, is it the primary provider of income for the household or is it part-time, is it seasonal? So employment may have several definitions depending on the program that is sponsoring it and how they define how they they fund the program. Um, so it's, a, it's an important resource to look at those, those topics and how they're defined. And you can find them also in the, the last start item, the surveys and programs. Um, so you can find specific details about the questions we ask and, um, and what federal funding is applied to it for those particular programs. Okay, um, so the next slide, uh, slide 11, is the geography matters. And, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with the geography at the Census Bureau, but what we do with the Census Bureau is we, we have a very large geography division. Um, our job at the, at the Census Bureau on geography is to provide framework for survey design and sample uh, selections. It's, it's used for not only collecting data, but we use it obviously for tabulating and disseminating data. So the geography department is constantly working to recollect geographic boundaries that are sent to us from local governments. If a city annexes um, a, a new subdivision, then, then that gets reported to the Census Bureau because we want the data to be in the correct boundaries of geography when we publish it so that funding is allocated correctly. Um, we do this in a couple of ways. We have a boundary annexation survey that is for geographies that are not part of the redistricting, like school districts, 
um, any annexations in local governments, any uh, political voting districts that can change. So these things can change, but any redistricting only changes every 10 years. And all of the data gets reported to our, our, our uh, geography staff, and they create and generate maps that give us that framework to put the data in when we disseminate it. Um, the link, if you have more questions about the geography program, is included here on this slide. Um, the next slide, slide 10, shows how we organize geography at the Census Bureau. So you can see we put data out in a lot of different geographies. We disseminate data in all of these geographic levels. However, not all topics are available in all geographies. So looking at this hierarchy chart, if you start at the top where it says nations and you go down the center to the census blocks, those are the redistricting geographies. Those geographies can only change every 10 years, and they're reported to us from local governments. The big one on there is census tracts, um, because that's what's considered kind of the neighborhood level, and it's what most ACS data is disseminated at in a low geography. We do have some ACS data available at the block group level, but it's not available at all block group levels because the population may not be dense enough that we can produce that data without compromising identity. Um, and, and the lowest level that census block is only available, data is only available from decennial census. We don't ever produce data at a block level other than decennial census. Um, everything on the left and everything on the right, starting with those zip code tabulations, school districts, um, these are data that can change. The geographies can change through the boundary annexation survey. So year to year, if there are changes reported to us, when you look at those, they may change. If a school district merged with another school district, which we see in rural areas, or a large school district in an urban area may split into two school districts, it, it may change how that geography is, is looked at. So those can always change. And the last thing I want to point out on this slide is place level. Place level is anything that's a city or in town, which are legal and incorporated governments, because they have a, a, a mayor, they have a voting board, but we also include in place level something called CDPs, census designated places. Census designated places can include places that we all kind of identify as an area, but they don't have a legal government. They don't have a mayor or a voting board, but we're all familiar with that. We treat all three of these the same when we publish data so that people can get that place level data for their community, even if it's not a local government. Um, next slide, slide 13. Um, I want to explain why it's important to understand geography because um, it, it changes the data so much. So the first map is showing the city of Kalispell, the place level. And, and for that place level, the veterans, those that identified having veteran status, is at 9.4%. So it's, it's uh, 1,824 people um, identify as being a veteran. And you can see those boundaries kind of have some islands there uh, for, for the city. The next one is the micropolitan area. Metro and micro are similar in that um, they encompass more than the place. They usually encompass anything that has um, infrastructure supported by the primary place. So it may be a water service, it may be road services, trash services, and you can see how very different the micropolitan of Kalispell is. It's much larger and it would include um, a population of 7,795, and it changes our veteran status to, to just under uh, 9%. Um, and the third one is what we call a zip code tabulation area. Um, a zip code tabulation area is similar to a zip code. Zip codes are 
are superficial geographies that the post office puts out there based on their carrier routes. Um, so we produce data at that, but we don't always change when the post office carrier routes change. So those boundaries might be a little different than a an official zip code, but they usually follow a zip code boundary. And um, when we look at one of those zip codes in Kalispell, when we look at the veteran status for, for this particular zip code um, tabulation area of 59901, we can see it increases the number of people that identify as um, having veteran status to, to 16.5, almost, you know, not quite double um, what the what the place level is. So when you're applying for funding and it's on a specific topic, understanding the different geographic levels is really important because when you're at 16.5%, you may qualify for funding that you may not have at 9.4% of, of the geography. So um, I, I hope that kind of helps. I know that's a quick summation of the geography, but I just wanted to give you an idea of why we put data out in so many geography levels and, and why it's important to understand those. Are there any questions at this point about the topics or the geography? Um, Kimberly, there was one question about um, access to data from past years. Mm -hmm. So um, you described the one year, five year, and then the decennial is, um, is that question clear? Yeah, it sure is. So we produce data in the primary data uh, data.census.gov, and it goes back to the 2010 census. There is some 2000 census data in there as well. Um, we didn't start publishing ACS data until 2005. So you'll have all the ACS data in there, 2000 and 2010. Anything older than that is um, archived data. And so it's at the Federal uh, Depository Libraries. It's on microfilm, so we don't have the ability to ingest it into the data.census.gov uh, product line. Um, but, but you can find it um, on the federal registries. There are some... Uh, links to some of the decennial census data that you can you can find on the census history webpage, and and that's uh, in in the topics you can find the history of Census Bureau, and then it'll have every decade in there. And when you click on the decade, it'll talk a little bit about the decade. It'll tell you uh, information about what what questions we asked, and it'll give you links. Uh, to the, the sources of data that are available or to the federal depository libraries. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that is awesome. And who doesn't love some good old microfiche and microfilm readers? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, and it is just that. You can tell they're, they're copies of those hard book pages. So uh, we simply don't have the resources to produce it any other way. But National Archives is then the owner of those uh, data products. The other thing to point out at that point is any, any census data that we have collected after 72 years becomes public. So if, if you were born um, and recorded in a census in the, um, let me think, the last one would have been published for the 1950 census, um, you can actually find yourself in that data at National Archives. Um, if you need to find your census records for identification for something like a, a passport application, we do have a form that you can send in. There's a fee, a mandatory fee that Congress determines you have to pay um, to get your census record, but there is not a guarantee that, that you'll get it if you don't have enough information for example, where you were born, or if you were misrecorded on a census, maybe they had you recorded as a male and you're a female, we don't backdate or change any census recordings in that way. So, um, but, but some people do apply for those, um, and it, it's a $60 fee, but anything else is at archives. That's great. Any I, other questions? Uh, oh, I'm no, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, I think that that covers the questions that we have 
so far. Okay. Um, there's another one that's a little bit more specific about school districts that I think we can address a little bit later on, but um, let's, sure. let's go ahead and go, go forward. Okay, so the next slide is about table type. And um, what I want to explain here is that when we produce data, we put them into tables and we, we put table identifiers on, on all the tables. And when we produce them year after year, they will be the same identifiers. However, if we change data, if we change content within those normal tables, they don't always retain the same table identifier because um, there may be enough change in that that it changes how we organize and recognize them. There are economic uh, table identifiers, but what you're looking at on this slide are demographics. So uh, there's, there's three primary types of table identifiers. The first one is decennial tables, and they'll start with P or H. Um, there's also some TO or um, some G tables, which are post-enumeration survey when, when an area uh, requested that we recount an area because they don't feel it was co correct. And then we also have in the older tables something called a, da a data profile 01, which is your basic numbers, uh, age, sex, race, and household composite. Um, then in population tables, we have some in data.census.gov, but most population tables are off-site in the population estimates website on the Census Bureau page. Um, some of the pop estimates are in there, but they're not cohesive for mapping with the platform yet. Uh, it's something they're working on. Hopefully they'll get more tables in there, but right now there's just a limited number. And, and on the bottom of the slide are the primary tables that most people use, which are the American Community Survey tables. And I tried to kind of put descriptions for what they are. So any base or collapse tables start with B or C, and they're, they're detailed tables about topics. Subject tables are detailed, uh, and we have some ranking, some geographic comparison tables. Um, there's some supplemental tables and some experimental estimates. Experimental estimates started with the the pandemic, when we needed to gather data about things that we didn't normally gather. For example, how many students are studying from home online, and then we would ask for their details, is it successful, what's going on with that, things we didn't normally capture in education data. So we have some estimates on those experimental products, we'll continue with them, um, but they, they evolve and revolve depending on the needs. We went from where are the children learning and are they learning at home or going to school to food scarcity and employment questions. So uh, experimental data changes. Um, but the data profiles, the DPs are big ones. If you've never explored those, we're going to look at those when we do some live demos because they, the DPs are a great way to look at data when you want to high level, just comprehend different aspects of of the data. The, the DPs are, are really valuable because they are just that high-level profile about socioeconomics, household dynamics, um, or population dynamics. Um, they're, they're really a great table to start with. Um, and the next slide, if you, if you go to the next one, I want to break down and kind of decode tables for you. Um, and, and hopefully that gives you a little idea of what, what those tables mean. So looking at this slide, it starts with a B05003A. The first digit in a table identifier is the, the um, type of table that is. It's the base table or the data profile. It, it starts with that letter combination of the type of table. The next two letters on this example 05 um, identify a subject of the table. So this is giving us um, the, the 05 is sex by age by nativity and citizenship status, uh, which is um, 033 are the unique identifiers of a topic within it. So, so that would be um, 
the the identifiers of citizenship and nativity. Um, so so the first one is the base table. The zero five is by age and sex, and zero zero three is telling us that we've 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 cross tabulated. We want to know about citizenship and nativity. And the last iteration is the race iteration. This is not available for all tables, but if it is, it's identifying race specifically. Um, we have five primary and the sixth other category for races that data is disseminated in. We collect data on multiple races for decennial and in the American Community Survey, but some of them get so granular, we can't produce data about the, the race or the detailed race without compromising identity. So, so that you will see these as white alone or and in combination, um, meaning if someone identifies as their primary race is white, but they also say that they are black or African American, and then they're identified as an in combination race. Um, the third caveat to that is um, ethnicity. So we collect data on ethnicity. At this time, race and ethnicity is defined by the Office of Management and Budget, which is the White House. And ethnicity is identified if someone is of any race and they identify as Hispanic or Latino, or not Hispanic or Latino. So you'll see the race categories and then Hispanic or Latino or not Hispanic or Latino attached to any of those race. If uh, a participant doesn't identify a race and they, and they only identify ethnicity, they go into the default of white and um, then the ethnicity. Um, but that, that kind of gives you a summary of what a table identifier is and, and why they have so many letters and numbers uh, to them and, and how you can keep track of those that you find really useful and, and remember them. Um, so are there any questions about table identifying? Okay, um, and I was gonna do a live demo for you. Um, this link here that you have in your slides um, and, and Kalei uh, will share the slides with you all. If, if it gives you the ability to search by a, a topic and a subtopic to find specific uh, table identifiers. So if you, if you want to remember tables and not search by topic, topic or geography, um, you can go in and search by tables to see what tables are actually available for the topics or the geographic level that you're looking for using um, this, this tool. It, it helps you to filter and shows you what tables you can get for those uh, specific tables and, and topics. And, and then the next thing I was going to go into were the live demos, which is starts on slide uh, 17. Um, but we're, we have about three minutes left, so I want to leave that open for questions. And then um, Colleen and I will put together, um, I'll, I'll do some kind of recording to send you walking through these examples. Please feel free to look at uh, slides 17 through 20. Um, I gave some directions about how you can do these searches um, with steps in them and, and what you can expect to get out of them, uh, but it doesn't really give you details about what you may look at in those. So I'll, I'll get a recording together for you on the last slides and, and navigating data.census.gov. That sounds great. Yeah. And they, does anyone have any questions? Uh, like uh, Kimberly said, we're coming to the end of our time, and uh, but we want to make sure that if there are questions, burning questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself, or uh, you can put those into the chat, and I will relay those to Kimberly. Yeah, and and please uh, feel free to to email me the school district one. I'm I'm happy to respond so you get an answer um, about that. And the last slide does have my contact information. Um, so feel free to reach out to me, um, but I'll work with Kalei about getting a demonstration for the 
the hands-on examples. And and I apologize for the IT issues. I haven't ever experienced something that severe that I get kicked out and then locked out. Um, but I, I appreciate your patience uh, with that all. And, and thank you for your time today. This is awesome. Yeah, it's Kimberly. I'm sharing your contact information on the screen now. As you said, I'll be posting the PDF of the slides and I'll send out a newsletter update when we have our recording together. That's going to probably take us a few more days than um, it usually takes me to get a recording posted. So with that, I just really appreciate everyone's time and your patience today. Thanks so much for having your lunch and learning with us today. And it's just been a great pleasure to spend time with you.